Good morning, everybody. Let's stand up together and tell somebody hello while we get ready for worship. seat. Morning, Burlington Baptist. We've made it to November. In the year of 2020, or 2020, that is a milestone that we made it to November, I'm going to tell you. I hope that you got to come up on Wednesday night and be a part of Trunk or Treat, the Candy on the Corner event. We were so blessed this week. We had so many people stop by in the community. It was a real blessing to be able to reach out to them. I thank you, especially if you're in this room and you were one of the people that um, did one of the trunks. What a blessing um, of you just giving out to the community, and I know that that is appreciated. Last night, I know in the neighborhoods as I was driving a little bit around, um, coming home from Lexington, uh, just watching the kids get out, and it's uh, it just makes your heart feel good that uh, some people are just, you know, they were wrapped up and they were doing what they were supposed to be doing, but uh, they were trying to create as a normal environment for the kids as possible, and it was a real blessing. And uh, I just wanted to start it off today by saying thank you for you guys. If you're a guest today, whether you're in the room or whether you're online, we always want to tell you how blessed we are to have you join us. And here at Burlington Baptist Church, it's just one big family, and that's the way we're going to treat everybody. So if there's anything that you need, don't hesitate to ask our wonderful guest service people out there in the foyer. They can point you to um, whatever you might be searching for. If you're online, don't ever forget uh, to continue to either message or to email us or text us. You can do that off the website. It's wonderful that you're a part of the services, even though you're not able to be in the house with us. Um, we know and we feel your presence and we appreciate uh, the way that you reach out to us each week. This week we go back into our normal uh, Wednesday night Bible study time. Youth will be meeting again. Still the children's programming um, won't be meeting, but still 
uh, we ask you to be a part of those, whether you're doing those online or whether you're present. And uh, there's the church just starts picking up again because the season's coming. How many of you have driven by the church at night over the last day or two? Have you anybody seen the lights around the church? Make a um, point this this evening when uh, it gets dark out to drive by. We've already started um, our preparations for Christmas because we know that we're only one month away from that. It looked pretty cool the other night, you know. You know, and, and Burlington's getting lit up, and uh, we just want to make sure that people realize that during the Christmas season we're going to be here for them. So make sure you uh, make a point and do that. And as always, if you are not in a Bible study group, we tell you to uh, reach out to us. We've got so many Bible study groups going on, ones that will meet during the service times, but also during the week. And we just want everybody to be able to feel comfortable to come into the house and be a part of the Lord's work. So today, as we get ready for worship, um, we've already started off with a great song. I know it's a real blessing. Um, this week, our challenge to you is to pray. If you haven't been praying, especially with the election this week, be praying for all the leaders and all the decisions that are going to be made this week. Let the Lord guide your heart and uh, lean on his understanding for all things. But make sure that you make your presence known this week and you get out and vote. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to be in your house today. And God, it, there's so much going on and we realize your presence in all things. Last night, watching the smiles and, and the laughter of kids as they were going from door to door, we realized that in your world, um, they hold a special place, and they do in our hearts too, Father. And during these times in which have been kind of a struggle to deal with, especially in this year, Father, we just ask that you continue to make yourself present and make your will known to us. This week, as we wind down with all the election and all the politics, we lift up our leaders, the ones that are going to be making decisions, Father. Just allow them to make those based on uh, your guidance and let them lean on your understanding. And the same thing goes for us, Father, as, as the family of God, well, we set opinions aside and we lean on you to know the direction that we need to follow. So we pray to you humbly, Father, this week uh, that you have your will done. And God is always, during this COVID crisis, we continue to lift up those that aren't able to be with us because of illness, because they might be in a little bit of uh, danger getting out and they just need that security of being home. We just ask you to continue to bless our church so we can minister whether we're online or in the house, Father, and reach out to those people uh, that so desperately need you. Father, we thank you for the blessings, how people still come to know uh, your son, Jesus Christ, even times that are uncertain for us. And today as we worship and we lift our voices to you in song, as Harold comes and brings your word, don't let us forget, Father, that you are in total control. And when we wake up in the morning, you're still sitting on the throne. Uh, a loving and a God that is entrusted with everything for our benefit. And you're watching out. So to be with us today, give us a great day in your house. We pray all these things in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. Well, the good news is the time has changed, so it gets dark around 5 o'clock. You don't have to even stay up late to come look at the beautiful lights at church, but let's stand up together, and uh, we're going to sing for our offertory. Yeah.
Join me in prayer this morning. Father, we want to praise you this morning because you have stepped out of heaven to come to earth to pay for our sins so that it can be well with our soul. Lord, thank you for that. And God, we just acknowledge you this morning as our creator, the one who created us, who loves us. Lord, sometimes the cares of this world seem to overwhelm us and... Uh, just remind us this morning of who you are, that you are sovereign, you reign, you're all-powerful, all-knowing, you're wise, you never make a mistake. Lord, you're so much bigger than all the things going on in the world, and so we just bring all those things to you. We pray uh, this uh, week for the election. We pray your will to be done. We pray for those battling COVID. Lord, we pray for vaccines. We pray for those uh, working on those. We, we pray for those battling COVID. We pray for those battling cancer. We know there are many in our church that are in the midst of that battle. We pray for them and the caregivers and the other ailments that people are battling. And Lord, we realize even this morning there are some who are not right with you and I pray for them. I pray that you might save someone this morning. That you might draw someone closer to you. That you might Call someone out of secret sin. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would uh, speak. Lord, I pray these next few minutes you would give us ears to hear. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Speak through me, Lord, I pray today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're in the book of Job. We're going to try to cover chapters 15 through 21 this morning. And uh, if you want to turn to chapter 19, we'll read from that. The title is Knowing Your Redeemer Lives, and uh, <clears throat> we followed the life of Job. We met Job in, in chapter 1. He was a, a man who loved God that was uh, living under the blessings of God. He had seven sons, three daughters, lots of livestock. He was uh, just a blessed man. Uh, Satan said, well, he, just, he loves you because you've been so good to him. And, and so uh, Satan asked to come against Job. He took all of his children, he took his livestock, everything that he had, basically. And uh, Job still trusted in the Lord. Chapter 2, uh, Satan wanted to come against his health, and he does. He puts these sores, he's miserable, he's just as miserable as you can be, and yet he still trusts in the Lord. And we've heard Job cry out in his pain and despair. Uh, last week we looked at uh, chapters 4 through 14, and uh, we saw these three so-called friends, I guess, uh, they make these piercing accusations against Job. The, the basic premise of what they say is that suffering is, is caused by sin, and because Job is suffering, uh, he must have some underlying sin. And, uh, and we said, you know, everything in life is just not that black and white. And so this morning we're going to pick up in round two, and kind of like last week, uh, Eliphaz will speak first, then Job will respond, Bildad will speak, Job will respond, uh, Eliphaz, uh, or Zophar will speak last, and then Job will respond. And, uh, and so I want us to read uh, Job 19, uh, 13 through 25, just to kind of get a, uh, a context. And so if you'll stand, and we'll honor God's Word. Job 19. Verse 17, verse 13, I'm sorry. He has put my brothers far from me, and those who knew me are wholly estranged from me. My relatives have failed me. My close friends have forgotten me. The guests in my house and my maidservants count me as a stranger. I have become a foreigner in their eyes. I call to my servant, but he gives me no answer. I must plead with him with my mouth for mercy. My breath is strange to my wife. I am a stench to the children of my own mother. Even young children despise me. When I rise, they talk against me. All my intimate friends abhor me, and those whom I loved have turned against me. My bones stick to my skin, to my flesh, and I have escaped by the skin of my teeth. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, O you, my friends, for the hand of God has touched me. Why do you, like God, pursue me? 
Why are you not satisfied with my flesh? Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead they were engraved in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at last He will stand upon the earth. Let me 26. And after my skin has been thus destroyed yet, in my flesh I shall see God, whom I ha- shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. All right, may God bless His Word. You, you can be seated. and, and uh, <clears throat> So we find Job, and he has sunk just as about as low as, as he can go. And uh, he's lost his family, his possessions. He's lost his health. He has these three friends, and uh, they really beat him down and uh, assaulted his character. They believe that he deserves all the suffering that has come upon him. And because they believe that he deserves it, they, they, just, they have no sympathy for his pain. And so with that as the context, uh, we're going to look at round two of his friend's counsel. And so turn back to chapter 15. Eliphaz, again, he's probably the oldest. He speaks first. And he starts over again, and he begins to speak, and, and we just notice the poison that begins to flow out of his mouth. Uh, Eliphaz, chapter 15, uh, verse 2, Should a wise man answer with windy knowledge? Now, it was Bill Dad last week that called Job a windbag, and, and uh, Eliphaz is going to kind of pick up on that again, and uh, windy knowledge, and fill his belly with the east wind. Verse 3, should he argue in unprofitable talk or in words with which he can do no good? But you're doing away with the fear of God and hindering meditation before God. For your iniquity teaches your mouth and you choose the tongue of the crafty. Your own mouth condemns you and not I. Your own lips testify against you. And so, uh, you know, there are a few things that are more hurtful than uh, when close friends use their words to wound us. And, and those wounds that come from those that are closest to us, they, they usually cut the deepest and they take the longest to heal. And, uh, and so that, that these words are sharp. I, I usually don't read from the message, but, but uh, the message is a little bit helpful uh, as we read through some of this advice from his friends. And so uh, here's how the message has these verses, uh, chapter 15, 2 through 6. If you were truly wise, you would... Would you sound so much like a windbag belching hot air? Would you talk nonsense in the middle of a serious argument, babbling baloney? Look at you. You trivialize religion. You turn spiritual conversations into empty gossip. It's your sin that taught you to talk this way. You choose an education in fraud. Your own words have exposed your guilt. It's nothing I've said. You've incriminated yourself. And so in other words, Job, your your own words condemn you. And then Eliphaz says, you know, really, you're, you're too young to know anything. Uh, down in verse 10, he talks about having the, the gray-haired and the aged uh, around him. And uh, so you're too young to understand. You're too arrogant. You, you're suffering, Job, because of your sin. Uh, and he just carries this on. So uh, in, starting in verse 17, he tries to uh, draw Job a, a portrait of the fate of, of sinners, And so verse 17, I'll show you, hear me, and what I have seen I will declare. Uh, Verse 20, the wicked man writhes in pain all his days, though all the years that are laid up for the ruthless. And so Eliphaz says, here's a picture of the wicked, Job, and it's, it's what you're going through. Verse 23, he wanders abroad for bread, saying, where is it? He knows that a day of darkness is ready at his hand. Verse 29, he will not be rich and his wealth will not endure, nor will his possessions spread over the earth. He will not depart from darkness. The flame will dry up his shoots and by the breath of his mouth, he will depart. And so Job, your life is a living hell and you deserve everything you're getting. And, uh, and so it's, a, it's an appropriate time for us just to stop and, and to think about what we say sometimes. Listen, the words that we say, our, our tongue, we can use it to comfort or, or we can use it to hurt. We can use our tongue to build up or, or to tear down. Proverbs 25, 23 says, How delightful is a timely word. And so God has given us a tongue to speak words, and those words can bring delight and comfort. And, and, uh, and yet sometimes, even as Christians, we can be so critical. 
I mean, this election and this virus, I think it's brought out some of the worst in a lot of people, including Christians, including myself sometimes. And uh, I hate it, don't you? Proverbs 16, 24, pleasant words are sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. When I look around, some of you are great encouragers and, and you speak words of encouragement. And, and thank you. I, I know uh, October was past appreciation. Thank you for your cards. And, and we're, I, you know, I'm not a big fan of that. I, you know, you all are, show your appreciation by showing up and serving. And, and I feel that all the time. But I, I thank you for it. Uh, every Christian, all of us, we should be encouragers. Now, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Encourage one another and build each other up. And yet, Job finds no encouragement from the words of his friends. Now, I'm going to skip most of Job's rebuttal to his friends, but in chapter 16, verse 2, he, he says, I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are you all. I, he said, I've heard enough. You all are a bunch of terrible counselors. You're no comfort at all. Verse 3, shall windy words have an end? Or what provokes you that you answer? I, when are you going to stop these windbag speeches? When are you going home? So then chapter 18, Bildad. Bildad's the, the shoe height. He's the legalist, the one I don't really like at all. Uh, verse 2 of chapter 18, how long will you hunt for words? Consider and then we'll speak. In other words, Job, won't you just stop talking and just listen? And then in verse 5, Bildad says, the, the light of the wicked is put out, and the flame of his fire does not shine. Your, your light is dim, Job, because of your wickedness. And then down in verses 8, 9, and 10, he, Bildad uses four different words to describe the dangers that people face when they remain in their sins. Verse 8, uh, you'll be cast into a net. Verse 9, a trap seizes him by the heel, a snare lays hold of him. Verse 10, a rope is hidden for, for him in the ground. And, and he speaks as if uh, Job is like a wild animal that's being trapped. Job, that's what you're experiencing because of your wickedness. Uh, you know, sometimes we wonder how to, uh, to read Job. And, and here's what I did. I started Monday morning. I just went through these verses. And just there are certain things that just really jump out at you. And you think, man, that's... That's sharp when you say that to, to someone. Uh, verses uh, 11. Terrors frighten him on every side and chase him at his heels. His strength is famished and calamity is ready for his stomach. This is for the wicked person. It consumes the parts of his skin. The firstborn of death consumes his, his limbs. Here, here he's talking about Job's skin disease. And, and he's saying that all of this is punishment for Job's moral failures. And then he concludes this, this chapter, verse 21. Surely such are the dwellings of the unrighteous. Such is the place of him who knows not God. And so Job, not only are you getting what you deserve as punishment for some sin, uh, but your suffering is evidence that you don't even know God. Now, think about that in light of chapter 1. Where God said, consider my servant Job, there is none like him on the earth. Blameless and upright, a man who fears God. There's no one like Job. And now he's got a friend saying, I don't think you even know God. And so this self-righteous religious man says that your suffering is evidence that you don't even know God. Listen, that is no way to help someone uh, who, is, uh, who is suffering. And so Job replies in chapter 19, How long will you torment me and break me in pieces with words? How long are you going to keep doing this? Verse 3, Ten times you have cast reproach upon me. Are you not ashamed to wrong me? Why do you keep doing that? And then round two is not quite over. We, we turn over to chapter 20 and we see Zophar. And he's the most brutal. He, he's dogmatic. Uh, he has a few more knives to stick into Job. And the only thing good about chapter 20 is this is the last time we have to hear from Zophar. He, he's not going to speak in round three. And so this is, this is all we hear from him. But uh, at the end of chapter 19, Job, uh, he, he ends with a little rebuke of his friends. He tells them that judgment is coming and you ought to be afraid of the, the sword and the wrath and the punishment of God's judgment. And, you know, some people can't take rebuke even if it's appropriate. And Zophar is offended by Job's words. And so in chapter 20, verse 3, I hear censure 
or rebuke that insults me. Job, I'm insulted by that. And I think, what a hypocrite he is. I mean, when Job defends himself, he is called arrogant. But when Zophar and his friends are challenged, they, they swell up with this righteous indignation. They're, they're insulted. And then verse 4, Zophar lets him have it. Do you not know this from of old, since man was placed on earth, that the exulting of the wicked is short, that the joy of the godless but for a moment Though his height mount up to the heavens and his head reach to the clouds, he will perish forever like his own dung. Those who see him will say, where is he? In other words, Job, you're going to die and your death will have the same value or significance as your own dung. And you say, wow, that's, that's nice, isn't it? Verse 11, his bones are full of his youthful vigor, but it will lie down with him in the dust. Listen, I mean, it's, it's wrong to say that a person who dies young, is, it must be because of sin or evil. I mean, all this, I mean, we think about David Brainer. He, he was a, a missionary to the American Indians. He, he was 29 when he died. We think about some missionaries like uh, Jim Elliott and Ed McCauley and Nate Smith and Pete Fleming. They, they were in their 20s when they gave their lives to take the gospel to the Aka Indians in Ecuador. We, age has nothing. I mean, Jesus died at the age of 33, and so Zophar is completely wrong with those kind of accusations. And then Zophar describes the plot of the wicked, and he correlates it to, to Job, verse 27. The heavens will reveal his iniquity, and the earth will rise up against him. The possessions of his house will be carried away. Well, that's what's happened, but uh, dragged off in the day of God's wrath. This is the wicked man's portion from God, the heritage decreed for him by God. And so, so far concludes that the wicked will experience total distress and misery and, and God's anger. And uh, he tells Job that, that God is going to rain down his wrath against him. Church, that is a distorted picture of life and death and the manner that God deals with His people. God is a good Father. He doesn't deal with us like that, even when we deserve it sometimes. And I don't know how Job could even uh, take listening to these attacks. Uh, chapter 21, verse 2. Keep listening to my words and, and let this be your comfort. Uh, let's listen to me for a minute. Verse 5. Look at me and be appalled. Lay your hand over your mouth. Would you look at what I'm enduring and just be quiet? And, uh, you know, it's often been said that God gave us two ears and, and one mouth so that we might listen more than we talk. And uh, sometimes we struggle with that, don't we? Psalm 141, verse 3, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Church, sometimes we just need to listen and stop trying to do so much talking. Proverbs 13, 3. Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. Job 21, verse 34. How then will you comfort me with empty nothings? There is nothing less left of your answers but falsehood and here's the bottom line in these chapters again is that we can't put God in a box we don't have him figured out so often we're clueless and folks it is arrogant and and not just arrogant but self-righteous to be so dogmatic about things we don't know they didn't know why Job was suffering like this and yet they speak like experts and, and, and in the end of this book, God is going to demand that they repent. And, and as we read through here, we say, well, no wonder. They need to repent. But, but part of our problem is that we're often arrogant and we're outspoken about things we can't know. And yet we're soft-spoken and, and uncommitted in regards to things that we do know. You say, what are you talking about? Well, so... So we know that lying is wrong and that adultery is wrong and cohabitation is wrong and homosexuality is wrong and abortion is wrong and bitterness is wrong and showing partiality is wrong and, and gossip is wrong. We know all those things are wrong. Let's speak about that. 
And we know that we're to care for orphans and widows and we're to feed the hungry and we're to, to take care of those who have needs, that we're to live holy lives, that we're to go and share the gospel, that we're to make disciples. Let's, let's be doing what we know to do and not be so arrogant about things we don't know. But we should spend less time speculating about things we don't know and spend more time doing the things that we know to do. And so when Job hears these things, his responses are often defensive, and yet there's some important truths in in some of his responses. And so let me point out a few of those. Go back to chapter 16. Job is responding to Eliphaz and what he has just said. And uh, notice in verse 19, chapter 16, verse 19, Even now, behold, my witness is in heaven. God sees, and he who testifies for me is on high. That's true. Verse 21, that he would argue the case of a man with God and a son of, as a son of man does with his neighbor. And so uh, last week, if you remember, Job cried out for a, an arbiter or a mediator between God and man. And, and we said that, that Jesus was the answer to Job's cry. 1 Timothy 2, 5, there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus is our mediator. Then notice in in verse 21, he he wants someone to argue the case. He wants a a, a defense or someone, an advocate. He wants a, a lawyer in a sense, a person that could go into the court of God and represent him. Now, we stand back for thousand plus years and and we look back and and listen as followers of Jesus that's exactly what Job wanted is what we have we have an advocate before the father so first John 2 1 John says my little children these things I write to you so that you may not sin as believers we don't want to sin but if anyone does sin and we do If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And so, church, the good news is we have what Job wanted. We have an advocate who is in heaven, who is at the right hand of the Father, and our advocate, and he's the only one that we need, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, he pleads the cause of sinners. Now, we have an adversary an accuser, Satan, he, he has lots of accusations. He has lots of accusations about me. I'll give him reason to have accusations sometimes. And so we have an accuser, but Jesus Christ, crucified and resurrected, he is the witness for the defense. And he's not just the witness, but he is the advocate for us. And so let's be clear about the defense. You and I, are, we're sinners. Our sin is real. We are guilty. But Jesus has suffered and died to pay for our sins and to provide us for to provide our forgiveness. And so God's justice was satisfied on the cross. And so we get to Romans 8 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And the reason is because Jesus has paid our debt. And that leads us straight to one of the most important sections, I think, in in Job. It's right here in chapter 19. Notice verse 23. Job says, Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Huh? Did that happen? Do we have his words in a book? Yes, it is. That's what Job wanted. He said, I, my words. Job longed for his words to be recorded somewhere, somehow, in a book. Or, or verse 24 says, oh, that an iron pen or lead, that they were engraved in a rock forever. Maybe these words could be written. And he, he never dreamed that they would be written. And we, thousands of years later, be reading those. But, but Job was certain that he was going to die. And he longed for future generations to, to read his words and in some way vindicate him. But then he says something so surprising. Surprising given the context of his despair. In, in verse 25, this is the most dramatic and, and famous declaration of faith in, in the whole book. Job says, For I know that my Redeemer lives. And then at last he'll stand upon the earth. Right in the middle of his despairing of his own life, somehow it has been given to Job to see through the sorrows to see to his Redeemer. 
Now, Job has said several things already. He, he thinks that he's suffering innocently. He, he thinks that God's being unjust. He thinks that he's going to die without vindication. And it's almost as if for a moment the clouds break and the sunlight shines through with this hope of the future. And, and he testifies to something that he knows, something wonderful. He knows that his Redeemer lives. Church, church this is good. The word for Redeemer is an important word. It's the Hebrew word gull. Goal, G-O-E-L, a a goal was a a close relative who had legal obligations in various cases to act on the behalf of a person. So if you were killed, your your relative would seek vengeance for your death. Or if you were sold into slavery because you couldn't pay off a debt, then your 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 redeemer, your goal, your they would go and, and pay back what you owed so that you could come out of slavery. We're familiar with this word in the book of of Ruth. If you remember Naomi and her daughter-in-law, Ruth, they return to Jerusalem. Uh, They're destitute. They have nothing. And uh, and they return to Israel with with no hope. And and so Naomi sends Ruth to to a field to harvest, to to get some gleanings that were left behind. And she ends up in the the field of of Boaz. And as we read through there in chapter 4, we realize that, that Boaz is the redeemer the kinsman redeemer, the goal for, uh, for Ruth and Naomi. And, and he, he marries Ruth and he takes on the responsibilities of Ruth and Naomi. He, he provides deliverance for them. And so as Job is crying out for justice from the hand of God, he says that he knows that there is one who will finally bring his vindication and accomplish his deliverance. His Redeemer lives. And 25 and 26, they're, they're kind of synonymous parallels to one another. And so uh, Job not only says that he knows that his Redeemer lives and that he shall stand upon the earth. That, that last phrase is a little tricky. It couldn't be translated that he'll stand upon my grave because Job knows he's going to die. And so I know my Redeemer lives. At last he will stand upon my grave. And the parallel, verse 26, after my skin is destroyed or after I die, this I know that in my flesh I shall see God. And so notice the, the parallel there. The figure who is his Redeemer in 25, Job knows is God himself. And so somehow, Job has this belief that after he is dead, God himself will step on the scene and will vindicate him, and his death will not be the end for him. Job's skin that has been destroyed will one day be restored. And in his flesh, verse 27, whom shall I, whom I shall see for myself... And my eyes shall behold and not another. My my heart faints within me. Job knew that he would see God. Now this is pretty deep. I studied it more this week. I even got up earlier this morning just to I'm not sure how much Job understood, but he certainly believed that God would be his redeemer, his vindicator. And looking back, we look way back to, to this time, we know that Job's redeemer did come. Literally, God did step upon the earth. He really did stand on the earth under which Job's bones lay buried. He stood there in the person of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus was Job's ultimate redeemer. Well, he's our redeemer. Jesus is the God who became man. And so Jesus stepped on this earth, and, and while he was on this earth, he suffered a mockery and persecution and agony of body and soul and mind, and he really did bear the divine wrath of God against sin and, and, and all that so that Job, and not just Job, but you and I might indeed be declared righteous and vindicated and, and justified before God. And so we even see that Job not only had hope in a Redeemer, but, but Job had this hope of a future resurrection to eternal life. So Job has all but given up on his earthly life, but he is heavenly minded enough to, 
face his suffering and the agonizing torment uh, of his so-called friends. And, and church, I believe that it was his heavenly mindedness that gave him the strength to persevere. Listen, what ultimately matters is not what man says about us. What ultimately matters is what God knows. It doesn't matter what others say about you. What matters is what God knows. And so what do we do in the midst of our suffering? We look to Christ and the gospel, and we cling to the truth that Jesus is our Redeemer. And like Job, listen, if we trust in Christ to be our Redeemer, God counts us righteous in His sight, and we have the hope of eternal life. We have the hope of a future resurrection. And it's in this hope that we're saved, and it's in this hope that we're able to endure the, the trials of this life, knowing that our present suffering in no way compares to the glory that will be revealed to us one day. Nothing, listen church, nothing that this world throws against us is able to compare to the glory that God has in store for us. Amen? And so let me just get sidetracked for just a moment before we... We, and listen, we have a big election this week, and it's important, and, and we should vote, and we should vote our values, and we have biblical values to vote on. But listen to me, we might not know whether Trump or Biden will be in the White House in 2021, but we know that Jesus Christ will be on the throne. Amen? The King of kings and Lord of lords rules and reigns, and everything else pales in comparison. And so, church, no need to fret. Our Redeemer lives and listen, I believe he's coming back one of these days. I, I believe it's soon. And uh, listen, I, I want you to know one day that when our Redeemer comes back, uh, our Lord and Savior one day will stand again upon this earth. And when he comes back, he's not coming back next time to be Redeemer. He is coming back as judge. He is going to be the righteous judge of this world. And then the books will be open. And if, if Christ isn't your Redeemer, you will stand before him and you'll give an account. And so Job ends that chapter, verse 29, by saying, be, be afraid of the sword, for the wrath brings the punishment of the sword, that you may know that there's a judgment. Job knew that there would be a future judgment. The Scriptures warn us over and over there's going to be a future judgment. Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed unto man wants to die, and after that there's coming a judgment. And so church, I, I'm out of time this morning, but I want you to know that there's a judgment coming. And I want to ask you, do you know Jesus as your Redeemer? And if not, you can. Do you have Job's hope? Even in the midst of the difficulties, he knew that his Redeemer lives. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Redeemer? Let's pray. Father, I pray that someone this morning, their eyes might be open to the fact that that Jesus stepped out of heaven and came to pay for our sins. Lord, I, I pray that you might remind us that the judgment is coming, that one day you're going to step back out of heaven upon this earth and there is going to be a, a great white throne judgment and many are going to stand before you and the books are going to be open and they're going to be judged according to their works. And they're going to come up short. They're going to be cast into a place of eternal fire and damnation. A real place called hell. And yet this morning they're invited to look to their Redeemer. And so I pray that if there's a person gathered here or a person listening who is still in their sin, may be good in their own eyes, but, but yet still in their sins. They've never come to Jesus. They've never confessed their sins and asked for forgiveness and put their faith in Jesus. I, I pray this morning you might save them. Do that this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand this morning and listen, I... I know my Redeemer lives. Jesus came and paid for my sins. I, I mean, a debt I could never pay. He paid for me. And I, I have the hope of eternal life and a future. my future is secured in Christ. Do, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, as your Redeemer? If not, I'd I love to talk to you about a relationship with Jesus. And, and listen, we got a few minutes. If you, if you want to come this morning, maybe, maybe you know Jesus personally. Maybe you just want to come this morning and, and pray for our land. I, 
I think it'd be a good morning to, to just pray for America. And, and you're invited to do that. You, you can come. You, you respond this morning as, as the Lord leads you. Amen. Just a couple of things. Uh, tomorrow night we'll have prayer at 6.30. We'll, we'll not only pray for our ones tomorrow night, but we'll pray for our uh, country and the election. We'll probably meet downstairs if you want to come by at 
And then on Thursday, we're going to take uh, dinner to the teachers at Burlington Elementary. They have parent-teacher conferences on Thursday night and uh, asked us to help with that. So we're going to make sandwiches and put them in boxes on Thursday at 2 o'clock. Activity Center, if anybody wants to come out, we'll, we'll have a good time doing that. Uh, and then, Brandy, you want to come and share a little bit about uh, this weekend? And uh, All right. You're welcome. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Brandy Ramsey, and I'm part of the search committee that's been looking for a new youth, um, young adult and youth pastor. And I'm so excited, y'all. We have found who I truly believe God wants to come to Burlington Baptist and be part of our church. Um, they have the times up here. Next Saturday, the young adults, students, and student parents get to meet with Jonathan and his wife, Sarah. Um, Church-wide, we get to meet at 3 o'clock, and then next Sunday, um, after both services, we'll be bo voting by ballot for Jonathan. Um, in the back on the little table, there is an information sheet that just tells you a little bit more about him. Also on the back, it tells like the qualifications for the job, um, what we were charged to look for somebody to do. But I just wanted to tell you, I'm super excited. I really, from the, the first time we met him, I thought... You know, this is who God wants us to have. Um, and it's very personal to me because we have three kids that are in the youth, and my oldest, Isaac, is a junior, so he'll be transitioning really soon to the young adult, sooner than I want. <laughs> I'd like to keep him little. Um, but Isaac really, really liked him and connected with him, so that just is a reassurance to me that, that this is who God wants, you know. So I just wanted to tell you all that. I'm really excited. We've worked really hard. We've prayed really hard, and I just want you to get pumped about meeting him next week. Thank you. So just one more thing on the way out, Dollar Club, the clear boxes, the offering boxes are the, are the black ones out there, um, just like every single week. And uh, let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity to come into your house. Lord, we just thank you uh, again for, for just the way you're moving in this church and the things that you're doing. Lord, we just thank you for the ability to kind of get together with the community this week and in, in the many ways that we've done that. And, and we just thank you for, for, for that ability again. Lord, just be with us this week as uh, the nation has a lot going on, Lord, and just help us not forget that you're in the middle of everything. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.